Hey everybody, Aaron Blaze here, back again for another Friday live stream. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about this week. Uh, welcome, it's February 3rd. We got Dustin over here behind me. We got Nick over uh, there in the corner. Hello. And uh, this is kind of a major uh, live stream today because we got a big announcement. In our big effort to get Snow Bear done, we've decided to make a few changes in our scheduling. And uh, so moving forward, um, we're going to be changing our Friday live stream schedule to uh, the first Friday of every month. So it's going to we're going down to a once a month schedule for our live stream uh, Friday live stream. And once again, that'll be our first Friday of every month. So technically, since it's Friday and it's February third, this is our first first Friday uh, live stream. And so we thought we'd announce that out to you guys, and that's going to enable me to get three more Fridays a month back into production. So um, uh, the upside of this is um, if you want to catch more of our live streams and our production live streams and that sort of thing, um, we have a brand new plan for that where you can go over to creatureartteacher.com and you can sign up for just our production live streams for a pretty low cost. I yeah, so the Friday live streams are going to be going to once a month, but on our website we still do live streams twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Yeah. And if you're a monthly member to our website, a annual member to our website, a Patreon member, or if you, uh, if you can't afford those things and want to purchase our new low-cost uh, uh, Snow Bear stream streaming yeah. membership. We membership. have that now available. You can learn all about that over at CreatureArtTeacher.com. Yep. And, and uh, uh, speaking of which, memberships are actually $75 off right now. And there's also another big announcement about memberships. You want to talk about that, Aaron? Uh, which one are you talking about? Because we've got our live event coming up. Yes. So we on February 25th, we've got a new live event coming up. Oh, Did I know what I I know what's wrong. Mute? I added a new scene. I forgot to add the audio into that scene for the for the gotcha. slide. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, okay, so so everyone saw the slide, so it can. All right, we're back. It. So yeah, anyway, so we're gonna, we're doing the live event, and but the cool thing about this is what we, what we've decided to do is um, in the past our live events have been discounted for members. Well, moving forward, we've decided because we want to up value our membership. Um, if you are a member uh, at CreatureArtTeacher.com, moving forward from now on, all of our live events are included in the membership. So it's not an added fee anymore. That is going to be, if you, if you become a member, not only do you get access to over 600 hours of all of our art and animation tutorial content, all of our Photoshop brushes, our production uh, live streams that we're doing twice a week, but you're also going to have access to every uh, online live event that we do moving forward. So in our effort to, like I said, just to keep up valuing our, our, our website and as a thank you to all of our supporters, that's how we're going to be moving forward. You can still buy it a la carte if you want to, um, but if you become a member um, and if you actually, if you, if, you know, after a year of membership, that basically covers the cost you know, just the live events themselves basically covers the cost of of, uh, of a membership. Absolutely. Yeah. And then on top of it, you get all of the, um, you know, like I said, the, the 600 hours of content. And we've always, you know, every month we're trying to put out new content. So um, as that library grows, you have access to everything. So there you go. Um, and also today's live stream, I want just to give you an example of what our production live streams are. So this... Um, moving forward, I probably won't be doing these again um, publicly, but I wanted to show you a little bit of Snow Bear today and, uh, and take you through a shot that I'm working on. And this will be a little taste of what you would get twice a week during our production live streams. So that's what we're working on today is um, Snow Bear. 
and uh, the animation, the shot that I'm doing. Uh, anything else you want to add to? Um, no, that's that for now. Let's just dive in. Yeah. So uh, once again, I just want to just reiterate because uh, I don't know if Dustin can go back to it. Um, I just want to reiterate the, the, the February 25th uh, live event that we're going to be doing. It's going to be on animal character design. And um, uh, if you go on over to creatureartteacher.com slash live, you'll be able to get more information on that. So there you go. And like I said, if you're a member, sign up. You're part of it. Actually, do members, if they're a member, do they have to sign up? Yes. Okay. So if you're a member, you still have to sign up, but you don't have to pay. Yep. There you go. The spots are still limited. It's still a live event, and we try to keep it in. Gotcha. Place, basically. All right, so let's, let's dive into this. So this is a shot that I'm animating. We're getting pretty far into Snow Bear. Um, once again, because I'm the only one creating it, um, it's taking a little while. But it's a labor of love, and we're having a great time with it. But we're about three minutes in to the animation now. And uh, this is a section where uh, Snow Bear... Um, he's walking along, you know, the first part of the, 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 the cartoon that we're creating, the first part of it story-wise is we see this is a big empty landscape and we find this polar bear wandering the landscape and he's lonely. He sees several animals. He wants to make friends with them, but they don't want anything to do with them. He's a big polar bear. And so he's lonely until at some point he's walking, at one point he's walking along this ridge and uh, he looks down from the ridge and he sees what he thinks is a polar bear, another bear. So here he is, he's walking along and uh, he looks over and through the mist he sees, oh, there's another bear sitting down there. So he gets excited and he goes over to the edge and he slides down, slides across the snow field, slides up, shakes off the snow. And immediately realizes, oh, it's a snow drift. And so this is the shot here. He gets up. And he goes over and just delicately touches it. It crumbles. Uh, he walks away. But then he gets an idea. So he walks over. And this is where he gets his big idea. Picks up a pile of snow. And he starts to make the snow bear. So that's where we're at. So this is the shot right here that I'm working on. Now you'll notice when I play this that it feel it's all pretty in between. It's well, pretty in between. It's all in between up through here. This is all in between. This is what I've been working on over the last two weeks. But here you can see that it needs the in-betweens. So that's what we're gonna be doing today is getting this nice and smooth through this section. Right through this section through here. But uh, just to give you a little context, this is uh, about a just over a 19 second shot i've been on it officially two weeks now i started last monday not this past monday but the monday before that's when i created the background and all that and then i started the animation on tuesday and here we are here we are friday two weeks later and i'm just finishing it up so this you know including the background this 19 second shot has taken two weeks so I'll give you a little context of how much time it takes to do this. Also, for those of you that haven't been part of our live uh, production streams, I want to show you how I started the animation because I've actually animated this twice. I start the animation like this. Look at this scribble. Starts out, this is how I rough through it. I'd spent about a day just roughing it out, very scribbly pass, like this. And once I get the timing right, there it is. So oh, Wolfie, I, go ahead. No, Wolfie just asked, when is the event on the 25th starting? That starts at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Yes. So there's, so that's how I start. Once I get it to where I like it, then I go through and I, I basically this layer, I lighten up the opacity on it and I draw over it and I tie it down. And that's how I tie down all the keys. And then I go through and I in between it all. And that's what we're doing here. So that's how I've gotten to this point. So you, you saw how rough that first pass is. 
and I'm constantly working to get to this point right here. So here he is. It's a little slow because the, the screen's so big. Doesn't pl quite play at the right rate. So there we go. So that's what we're working on. Now you're all caught up. And I'm going to start breaking it down and adding in-betweens. And like I said, if you want to see more of this, and, and it's, it's actually a lot of fun. We've got a great little family, I, I like to call them, that, you know, that, you know, we get together, like I said, every Tuesday and Thursday. And um, it's nice and intimate. And uh, we'd love for you to be part of it if you want to join us. Well, Will Brewster um, asked a question saying, hey, Aaron, I love that studio tour vid you uh, posted several weeks ago. Uh, can I ask if it's possible to purchase that art bag uh, that Artisan uh, made for you? I really want to get one. Uh, well, I've got two different art bags. I've got one from Lilo Rosh that's a, that's a, a little cheaper price point, uh, and they're beautiful. So that's LiloRosh.com. And then uh, the other one is, uh, I have to get the information for that one because I don't have it off the top of my head. That's from Eddie Carrasco. And the Lilo Rosh one, uh, Lilo is spelled L-I-L-O? Yeah, Lilo Rosh. All one word? Yep, dot com. Dot com. And I've got several of their art bags. I love them. For those asking, Aaron is animating in TV Paint. That's the software. Yes. Using. Yep. I'm animating in TV Paint. To um, paint. I've never used Toon Boom. For those of you that are going to ask me that, um, I've Why always used Toon Boom. <laughs> I've always um, just used TV Paint. I've never tried anything else as far as digital painting software goes. Um, you know, right before I used TV Paint for the first time, I was still animating on paper. So for me, it was a pretty nice smooth transition that's one of the reasons i stuck with it i really like it uh what song was jim jackson singing at the disney studio back in december 1994 for the christmas <laughs> parties that was mr jones he sang a lot of different songs he did a lot of stones covers We did some Commodores covers. Did Pat Benatar. <laughs> so what's important at this stage is really focusing on keeping volumes solid and you know there's not a lot of fast movement so i got to make sure i'm keeping arcs really solid and um slow ins and slow outs if you can get your slow ins slow outs and arcs working right you're 80 percent there Hope everybody in the rest of the country here in the U.S. is staying warm. Man, we got a really major cold snap coming through the Midwest and the Northeast. I know in Burlington tonight, it's supposed to go down to actual temperature, minus 13. That's my hometown. Well, that's where I was born, I should say. I grew up here in Florida. Uh, when you started at Disney, did you start off as an in-betweener or an assistant? I started off as an assistant. 
I was one of the lucky ones. go. So I'm constantly flipping back and forth. Constantly flipping back and forth so I could see that movement. Another thing too I want to show you really quick is in, in regards to paying attention to your arcs. Look at over here. If I light up, I'm going to light up like the back 10 drawings. Here you can see in my onion skin I, I lit up the last 10 drawings leading up to this drawing. See how, see the arc with the head turning? You know, paying attention to arcs, paying attention to the distances between your drawings. This is what gives you fluidity in your animation and, uh, and, and gives it more dynamics as well. Uh, was Glenn Keane mentored by Ollie Johns Johnson or Eric Larson? Ollie Johnson. Ollie was his mentor. Have you ever seen Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? I love it. Yes, I have seen it. I, I really like it. And I uh, had a lot of friends that worked on it. Uh, for your character design event on the 25th, do you already have certain character designs to use as demonstration, or will you be taking suggestions regarding what characters to design throughout? I'm not going to be taking any suggestions, but I am, or at least not off the, that's not on my plan. We might decide to do something later. Um, I've, I've got, I'm going to design some off the cuff, um, off of some ideas that I've got in my head right now, but I'm also going to take you through some of my uh current designs or other designs that I've done in the past. Also, I want to, I'm going to spend a bit of it because it's all about, you know, getting a little bit of anthropom anthropomorphizing um, your designs. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about comparative anatomy as well. Um, there's a few things we're going to cover. Uh, YouTube question. Hey, Aaron, I know if I want to darken a color, I add its opposite. But since there are an infinite number of colors, how do I know which color are opposites? Well, it's not always adding an opposite. you, you got to put that out of your head because a lot of times adding the opposite color to darken it will also gray it. And sometimes you don't want to gray it. Sometimes it's just darkening the value. And... Uh, or you can use an, a, a darker analogous color to keep to keep the hue strong. Uh, you can, you know, if you want to stay, like say you're working, you want to do shadows and you're in cool colors. If you have a blue shadow, you wouldn't want to add orange to darken it. You would want to add, you know, something, a, a darker blue maybe. So there's there's no set rule as far as that goes. I mean, there, there's rules as far as what happens when you mix certain colors, like... If you mix opposite colors, you're going to mix. That's when you mix brown. That's when you're going to create browns and grays. But um, but to darken, there's a lot of different reasons why you would darken a color, and so there's a lot of different ways to do it.
Oh, Castro Sabiri says, uh, Aaron, I have good news that this summer I might go to uh, Africa. And would you suggest for me to go to South Africa, Tanzania, or Kenya? Any suggestions? Well, my only experience has been Kenya and Tanzania. And of the two of those, I've got much more experience in Kenya in the Maasai Mara. Um, been, I've been to the Maasai Mara four times. And it, we've never, you know, and with Nick... Nick, I've been twice with, and Dustin's gone with us. And we've had great luck each time we've gone. Especially with them leopards. Yeah. I'll be curious to see if we make it back, you know, in the near future, what it's going to be like, because they've had such a severe drought there. Yeah, I know. Mm. Um, Mary on Twitch asks, what level... Are uh, do you need to be at for being able to draw before you can work as a Disney animator or even as an assistant for a company the size and quality of Disney? Well, there's no I don't know that there's a any there's no straight answer for that. You just you've got to be at a professional level, I guess is the right answer. But you've got to be um, you've got to be able to hold your own as a as a as a uh, as an artist. You know, one of the things I always say is that especially in in uh, in 2D animation. Now I know 3D is a little different nowadays, but especially on the development side of things, you've got to be able to draw. You don't necessarily, nowadays you don't necessarily have to be able to draw as an animator. Um, but if you're doing 2D animation, you definitely have to draw. And we always talked about, you know, the drawings being our, the, the visuals being our, that's our language. You know, we're, we're talking, speaking visually. And um, so the better you can draw, the better you can speak that language. Become fluent. Have you ever considered visiting Kevin the Lion Whisperer and sketching at his place? No, I haven't. I'd rather go see them out in the wild. I've heard uh, Ryan on YouTube asks, I've heard you talk about this subject before and always wanted to know why you think that the promotion of a big movie can be so poorly executed, even if the movie is well made. Any ideas on to why that happens sometimes? A lot of it, it all comes down to budget, you know, and, and sometimes a movie will take you off guard. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll sign off on a movie thinking it's not going to be a hit, so they won't throw money at it. Other times uh, they'll go through the budget and... Um, uh, they won't have any money left over for for advertising. Advertising can be as much as, you know, one and a half times the actual budget for the film. So it can get really expensive. Um, also, sometimes it can be creative, right? Like the, the creative head of marketing might have a different vision of the film in their head than... Yeah. That can happen too, right? Yeah. It's not as common, but it does happen. It happened with us. So it happens for sure. Uh, did you see the recent video with the Corridor crew interviewing uh, Tom Bancroft? And would you collaborate with them if you got a chance? The who? It's the, the, the Animator crew. Reacts. Yeah, it's the video I sent you. Where oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I definitely would do something with them for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I watch their stuff all the time. How often do you intend to do those live workshops on your website? Uh, we do about three or four a year on average. Yeah, about four a year, once every three months, four months. But remember, with that membership, uh, not only do you get those live events, you'll also get every single course on the website, every single brush on the website. Yeah, you get everything. Yeah, plus uh, you also get uh, discounts on physical merchandise like books and posters and all that stuff. It's a good deal. It's a good deal. 
Do you have the story in your head or do you have it uh, storyboarded or scripted? It's all storyboarded and scripted. We wrote it up first and then we've, we've got it uh, completely storyboarded and I'm constantly, not as much anymore because we're getting it more and more solid, but constantly changing the boards as we come up with new ideas. <clears throat> but it's been, uh, it was actually one year ago that I started storyboarding it fully, my, you know, ourselves. We had it boarded by April, end of March, beginning of April. My own personal question, are scripts um, written even if there's no dialogue in that uh, yeah, project? Yeah, absolutely. Wally had a script even when it was no dialogue. Uh, what did you think of the movie Onward? I didn't see Onward. Oh, I did see Onward. I thought it was okay. I liked it. Yeah, I thought it was fun. Yeah. Didn't blow me away, but it was a, it was yeah, a I liked pretty it. solid movie. Reminds me of a Seinfeld bit. He's like, everyone always wants to be blown away. What's just happened to like a good meal? <laughs> <laughs> How did Toy Story, the first What's computer the animated movie, uh, become a giant hit? How did it become a giant hit? By, by having an incredibly great story. That's one thing Pixar is, you know, they're one of their greatest assets is their ability to tell stories and really compelling and create great characters they also well. had a good budget yeah i mean people forget before disney bought pixar i mean their previous owner was steve jobs yeah but i mean disney was subsidizing story no no i just mean it wasn't story. like they didn't have any money to work with to get that film off the ground oh right yeah <laughs> uh, it Kirk wasn't a it was an independent studio but it wasn't a little tiny non-funded in your garage type thing either no uh, Kirk Zimmerman says uh, just signed up for the workshop on the 25th really looking forward to it oh good thank you yeah for those people that want to may have joined late uh, this uh, on Saturday February 25th we've got a live uh, animal character design workshop with Aaron Blaze um, that's that's, me. that's at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's going to be an all-day event, and you can sign up at creatureartteacher.com slash live. You can purchase uh, individual tickets. Uh, spots are limited. Or if you become an annual membership to our website, uh, which is $75 off right now, Oops. it gets you from now on, this is a new benefit to membership, not only all the courses on the website, but also all of our live events, our online live events. How many tries does it take typically for you to draw a character until you're happy with it? <laughs> um, there is, there's no typical. It's whatever it takes for me. Um, usually my process is, you know, I'll draw, I'll draw, do lots of draw overs. I'll draw over it and over it and over it, changing proportion changing different things until I start to hit on something that I like that I feel is compelling. Ever work with an animator named Ron, uh, Ron, Ron Husband? Husband, yes. I've known Ron Husband for 30 some odd years. We've got a drawing or two of his sitting around the office somewhere. Yeah, yeah. He's drawn and, me a few times, yes. And his last name is actually Husband? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, matter of fact, I, we saw him last time we were out in uh, at CTN, and he just did a uh, he just did a um, a podcast. In one of a our podcast, you say? Yes. I think I'm hitting everything here. Aaron, do you have a favorite 3D movie in terms of attention to detail, mm. such as Patterns or something like that? I don't know. Um, 
No, no, that's that's an interesting question because from an artistic standpoint, I don't know that I think about a 3D film from an artistic standpoint. Um, Story-wise, I you know the Incredibles and all of that are my favorites. Um, let me shrink this up a little bit. When I shrink it, I, it plays back in real time. Um, but no, I don't know that I have. I mean, I think the uh, Encanto is a really beautiful film. Moana was a really beautiful film. When considering curves or arcs on movements, do you draw them out as a guide or because of your experience, do you just do them intuitively? I do them intuitively. I, I see the arc in my head. I'll double check it every once in a while, but I definitely see the arc in my head and I follow it. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have to go back and make adjustments because I'll make mistakes. You know, this long sweeping arc when he turns back towards the camera, um, I had to make some adjustments in there. And even still, there's a little bit of a wobbliness in there. But right in um, right in this section, you know, it's not perfect, but it works pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. All right, so I've got basically all of that down to fours. Is TV paint standard edition enough, or do you need or is professional necessary to make an episode of animation? No, it, the standard edition is perfect for making animation. If you want to expand it into a studio. Then you want to get the professional. Yeah, the biggest difference, there's a couple of differences, but the biggest differences between the two is that the professional version is set up more for a, a pipeline or a studio environment. There's also a few additional coloring features you get in the professional, but yeah. you can absolutely do complete full animation in the standard version. You also get a huge discount on TV paint. I think it's it's almost 40% off. I was going to say, the, dis the discount on TV paint is almost equal to the cost of the membership. I think it's, depending on which version you get, it's theoretically even more. So it's it, it pays for itself. Yeah. Yeah, I really love TV paint. And so, and I'm one of these guys where if I like a product... You know, I'll use the heck out of it, but we'll also contact the people making the product to let them know. So we did that with TV Paint, and, and we struck up a relationship with them because I like it so much. Which is why we're able to offer the discounts. Do you prefer the work of Glenn Keane or Eric Goldberg? Glenn Keane. I love them both. And I love, I love Eric. But Glenn, Glenn was my mentor. Glenn taught me animation. So I'm a little bit biased there. Buzz. Yeah, I'm a little bit biased. But they're both incredibly brilliant, brilliant animators. And they're both a little bit different in their approach spiritually. You know, Glenn is much more, I would say, spiritual in his approach to animation. Eric uh, tends to be more comedic and fun and uh, pushed. Have you ever spoken to Todd Polson? I got to speak to him last year when I was at CalArts uh, High Touch Animation Program. Todd Polson. Do we know him? I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. I don't know Todd Polson, unless it's somebody we've met uh, in some of our endeavors. Uh, he did some work on Secret of the Kells with Cartoon Saloon. He worked on the Book of Life in the art department. I don't think you would have crossed paths with him, unless it was at CTN or something. Yeah. Nope. But I'd like to. Will you do a colorization course? I really need to learn how to color. Uh, now, they might mean for animation, I don't know. But if you're talking about just general painting and color. We've uh, got lots of painting courses. Lots of painting courses and color theory and yeah. dynamic light and how to paint light and shadow. If you go over to creatureartteacher.com, um, yeah, a just, lot of those courses are on sale. Just go to our website. For those of you that are interested, just go over and, and just kind of click around and explore it. We've got... 
we get so many questions from people saying, hey, do you have this? Do you have that? If you go over there and look, you'll find that we've got a lot of different courses there. And um, just go on over and check it out because there's, we've got tons. We've been doing this for uh, nine years. So we've been building content for that long. Now, if you're talking about coloring for animation, we don't really have a ton on that yet. Something we different. will. One of the things that we're going to be doing with Snow Bear is uh, not only do we want to get it into the festivals and you know have it be a film that everyone can see, um, we're recording everything that we do in the making of it. And, uh, and we're going to turn it into a course on how to create your own animated short. So the entire process, not just the the storyboarding, the writing, the animation, and all that stuff, the stuff you'd expect. But we're going to cover the music. We're going to cover the sound effects. We're going to cover a lot of the post-production stuff that a lot of times gets missed. So once again, if you guys like this, if you like watching this and want to be involved uh, and just basically you want to watch me make this it's going to take me about another nine to ten months to make this short and uh we're going to be live streaming it every uh, two times every week uh two times a week tw tuesdays and thursdays um every single day yeah which there's there's basically uh three ways you can get access to those streams you can become a member to our website at creatureartteacher.com you can become a patreon supporter uh of aaron or uh, we just rolled out also a Creature Art Teacher uh, sort of lower tier membership, which gets you access to those streams specifically if you don't quite want to swing for all the courses and everything. Yeah, you can get just the, the streaming itself. Aaron, do you like Satoshi Kon's, uh, Satoshi Kon's work? He did uh, Paprika and those anime movies like Perfect Blue. You, you don't watch a lot of anime, so you probably I don't, don't watch anime, so I don't, know, I don't know the person that you're talking about. I'm familiar about. with those movies, but I haven't seen them either. Which one? Uh, Paprika, Satoshi Kon, he did um, Paprika and Perfect Blue and uh, a bunch of other ones. Paprika, sounds familiar. Oh, that Paprika. <laughs> I believe it's Paprika. No, the Spice. Yeah, it's funny. The first thing I look, looked up was just paprika, and uh, and and that's what it showed was the I was the uh, the spice. Uh, as far as the anime goes, yeah, I've seen clippets of that of the movies. Looks really trippy, and uh, I really want to see it, but I haven't found a found a place that uh, provides it. But I just don't think I'm looking at the right spots. And what's the other the other movie that was mentioned? Paprika and uh... Uh, I think is it Perfect Blue or I think I think it's called Perfect Blue. Hold on one second. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna step out for one second. Oh yeah, he's done a bunch of stuff actually. So. Oh, yeah, Perfect Blue is the, uh, about the idol singer with the stalker. Yeah, they're both, um, 
supposed to be like psychological thrillers back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Paprika is 2006 and Perfect Blue was released in 97. Have you gotten to see Puss in Boots yet, the new one? I have not. I keep wanting to do it. I keep missing uh, not doing it, but I got to pull it up and watch it. I hear it's great. Yes. I actually find it, uh, you know, it's kind of bold to say, but I find it a lot better than the uh, the first person was in boots. That's awfully bold. The first one's great, the first one's fun, but this one I, I, I like quite a bit more. Like the characters, the animation, all of it. Even the art style, like I was a little hesitant about the art, art style at first, but in the end I really liked it. Yeah, it's nice to see lately things changing up stylistically. It feels like everything was basically the same style. Yeah, everything was trying to for look so like Pixar long, for a while. For like 20 years, it seems like. Well, yeah. I really think you can credit kind of two movies with with that shift in style. I think Spider-Man. Uh, Spider-Man is yeah, one of them, yeah. but I think even before that you can go to the Lego movie. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And I think that started showing, hey, you can do hit CG movies that aren't, you know, that's what started making people be well, willing to push that style. You know what else is interesting to me is I'm Same starting, directors. So. Is, no, the the a lot of the people that really grew up on anime because uh, my generation, not so much, or at least not here in the States. Um, but a lot of the kids, are kids, but they're adults now, they but grew like up my, on anime. That, that, that design sensibility is making itself, making its way into mainstream films now too, which mm -hmm. I find interesting. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Especially in the, like in the film Puss in Boots, uh, Last Wish. I mean, really, that's been going back for a while, even into live action, I mean, the, the Wachowskis totally were inspired by anime when they did The Matrix. Yeah, Matrix oh, was, yeah. was inspired by uh, Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, a bunch of animes, not just Ghost in the Shell, but yeah. That was a huge one, though. Yeah, for sure. Whole, being able to jet, uh, sure. jack into the net and everything, that was, yep. that was Ghost in the Shell. Well, I was just talking about animation character design style. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying that that, that filmmaking style yeah, in general yeah. is creeping, has been creeping for a while. But yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's definitely getting to be more and more as, as a certain generation. Yeah. Uh, Twitch question. Aaron, what do you see as the future of 2D animation? Could it be as important as it once was? I think it can be. Actually, I think there's a great opportunity for it. You know... I don't think it's dead. I think it's up to people that want to make 2D animation to continue to make it in order for it to stay relevant, which is a big reason why we're doing this. I, want, I don't want 2D animation to go away, so I want to make something that you know, we can be proud of and people can go, hey, wow, two, look at this. You can, you know, 2D animation isn't dead. I forgot. I've had so many people that have seen clips of what we're doing go, man, I really miss that kind of animation. And that, that's a great compliment to me because it's bringing back, you know, this nostalgia for something that, not that I ever want to go backwards, I don't want to do that, but I just don't think that, you know, it's a 2D animation, hand-drawn animation is a beautiful medium that I think went away for bad reasons. I think it was bad stories that caused it to go away. And, you know, CG animation was flashy and cool and everything else. But I think, um, you know, with the new generation now, now that things have settled down a little bit, um, I think if we can get some really good 2D animation out there, it can definitely come back. And, it, and as long as we can make, if you can make, you know, features on a decent budget in 2D, which I think they did with Klaus, um, Klaus was a much better budget than anything that Pixar's doing. Pixar's 
you know, they're putting two hundred million dollars into every film. It seems like, or Klaus did forty forty million into their budget. And Cartoon Saloon makes their movies for like 12. yeah, for even like twenty million, right? Yeah. I think it's like twelve. Yeah, so. When you're animating, do you try to ensure volumes are consistent in the first pass of rough animation, or do you build up volume consistency once I volume try, consistency once timing is down? Yeah, I always I, struggle with volume. I try to make sure volume is consistent at every step, because if it's not, you're always going to be correcting it. So the the more consistent you can get it in the beginning, the better off you're going to be. So, like even that and that scribble pass that I showed earlier. There's, you know, there's a little bit of volume inconsistency, but it's basically volume consistency <laughs> through there. As an artist, have you ever went into a, in a dream into the world that you had spent days or weeks creating? <laughs> no, I've never done that. It's a kind of a cool idea, though. Yeah. Uh, this might be a tough question. Aaron, what is your least favorite animal? It can be your least favorite animal to draw or just an animal you don't like in general. <coughs> the human animal. <laughs> <laughs> Humans can be so annoying. <laughs> um, fire ants. Oh, yeah. I hate fire ants. <laughs> mosquitoes. At least mosquitoes serve some, some kind of purpose. They feed, a lot, of, they feed a lot of fish and mm -hmm. insects and I mean, uh, mammals and things like that. Fire ants, not so much. The thing is that, is that ants, they kind of tend to stay in their, their area. Mosquitoes, though, they don't care. <laughs> they, as soon as the sun go, goes down, or if it's night, or if it's a hot and buggy enough, they start coming out in droves. Oh, yeah, I've had... I've got some mosquito stories for you, but yeah, fire ants, that's the number one for me. I just started your horse course. Do you cover anatomy in it? The horse course? Yes. Horse course? If you just start, uh, you must have just started the intro because everything in it is about anatomy. So the answer is yes. The horse the, course? Of course. The entire course is about anatomy. Oh, he says, I messed up. I meant to say skeleton. Do you cover the skeleton? In it? Not a whole lot. I do cover some of the skeleton. I cover the skull. Um, but when I, in my animal drawing courses... It's not about every I bone. Touch, I touch on uh, the skeleton, but it's mainly about the muscle masses and how they... Basically, how they hang on the skeleton, but really how they how they kind of work together, so that you can get the form. It's yes, less about exactly. Uh, it's definitely not a, 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 a an academic anatomy. academic yeah. anatomy course. No. Uh, for for possibly uh, newcomers, uh, you want to explain real quick on uh, what's what's going on in the future of this uh, Friday live stream and why we're... we're yes, yeah, so it. this is our last um, weekly Friday live stream. We're going to be going uh, down to uh, one a month, and we're going to be doing it the first Friday of every month. So, you know, this is our first Friday of February, and so we're doing our live stream today. But our next actual live stream, public live stream like this, will be March 3rd. So that's what we're doing. We're doing that in an effort to increase my production on Snow Bear. I want to be able to get as much time working on this film as I can in order to get it done um, in, in somewhat of a timely man manner. It's still going to take about 10 months, uh, even from where we are now. So it just, it takes a lot of time. And so I try to, I want to try to get as much time as possible. So as a result of that, um, I'll be doing more time uh, in our production live streams and um, so if you want to continue to see you know on a weekly basis what we're doing or actually even increase then become you can become a member uh, you can uh, become a, a patreon uh, a donor or you can 
also we have a new plan where you can get just the production live stream itself and you can pay for that as well and that's all at creatureartteacher.com creatureartteacher it's dot com and um and we might still do some impromptu streams here yeah from time to time as well but the but the scheduled streams are going to be the first friday of every month for the for the foreseeable future while we at least while we're making this yep and uh do you know how long this uh uh feature this short feature will be is it officially set in stone yes it's 10 minutes 10 minutes 10 minutes i know it doesn't sound like much but for one person, that's a mountain of work. <laughs> and you started animating last year, didn't you? I started animating in July. July last year. Yep. And you've gotten how many minutes done so far? Uh, a little over three. Three out of ten. Now, granted, during that, since July, we've been sidetracked on other projects as oh, well. Yeah, it hasn't been straight. 40 hour weeks of just animating yet right so we're trying to work towards as much of that as we can right now are piranhas from africa or south america south america they're amazonian amazonian Also, for those of you that watch us, follow us on YouTube um, and depend on the, the live streams each each week, uh, just keep in mind as well that we're upping our production of our... Refresh the chat. Oh, no. Refresh the chat. On the one per month live stream, will you also do more traditional art? That's going to continue to be a mix like we do on the weekly stream. Yeah, right? it'll just be... Sometimes it'll be a... Yeah, it'll be traditional. Sometimes it'll be digital. Sometimes it'll... I don't know. We'll do an unboxing. We'll do a tour. Who knows? Have a special guest. Yeah, one of the things... Our, uh, one, of our, um, one of our instructors and good friend, Ronnie Williford, uh, his brother, Hollis Williford who's passed away it's probably a very one of the best uh, uh, contemporary uh, Western artists in recent memory and uh, they're putting together a, a book of his work and uh, in, it's in the publishers now and so we told Ronnie that when the book is out we want to do a live stream with him and it's really showcasing his brothers you know Hollis Williford if you're not familiar with Hollis Williford look him up H-O-L-L-I-S W I L L I F O R D, Williford. Um, amazing sculptor, painter. He was great. And a really nice guy. If I animate a bouncing ball or walk cycle and it, uh, it looks good to the viewer, does that mean my rules and principles of animation are correct? Um. Yeah, if it looks good, if it, you know, now sometimes you might not have the experience to tell if it's not looking right. <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the things I always say about being able to draw and paint is not the ability to, to draw right the first time. It's the ability to see when you've done it wrong. And the same goes for animation, I think. Oh, somebody said the stream cut out. Uh, for those of you that depend on YouTube for our live streams, keep in mind that, and then the, sh the sound cut out, I guess the stream dropped for a second. Um, what Aaron said is we're going to continue to be putting out pre-recorded videos on YouTube every week, typically every Wednesday. So we've been upping the number of recorded videos we've been putting out. So you'll still be able to see content from us. Uh, just definitely, from, yeah, we're going to put out a weekly video every, you know, every week. Yep. 
A weekly video every week. Yeah, we're continuing the, the weekly YouTube weekly videos. Weekly videos down on the, every third month. <laughs> That's right. Every third month a YouTube video? Yeah, just, <laughs> just kidding. A weekly video every third month is what I said. How much time did it take you approximately to animate a minute of Snow Bear in good, um, in good conditions? In good years. conditions, I can do a minute in just oh, like five weeks, six weeks. So about a minute a month. A, a minute a month, a little less than a minute a month. That's, that's my goal. But I'm also doing the backgrounds. So it slows me down to touch as far as the animation goes. Have you ever done any stop motion animation? And also, what did you think about Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio? I um, Guillermo del Toro, del, Toro, del, Toro, del Toro, holy moly, I couldn't <laughs> say it. Uh, Pinocchio really grew on me. I, at first, uh, wasn't crazy about the design or the storytelling, but I, um, to Nick's persuasion, I finished it out, and I'm glad I did, because I ended up really liking it. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, have you ever done any stop motion? Oh, animations? no, I haven't done. I've never done stop motion. No. <laughs> Martin Burgess, are you okay, Aaron? <laughs> I am now that I know Martin Berger's watching. <laughs> I like Twain. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Philip says uh, a live workshop on making backgrounds for animation would be a fun idea. Oh yeah, that's in the works. I got a hair on my nostril, it's driving me nuts. Looks like Zoundji just hopped on just a, just a minute ago. Zoundji? Zoundji. Late from lunch. <laughs> That's right. Was Mark Davis a better draftsman than Milk Call? No, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, everybody in that, in, in that realm were good draftsmen. So to say one person's better, you know, Milk generally has the reputation of being the best draftsman. Um, but, you know... You can look at anybody during that time, and everybody could draw really well. Everybody looks terrible compared to Milk Call. For movies like Brother Bear, since you did the style of the drawings and they're mostly yours, uh, did you do all the drawings and animation initially, or did someone copy your style to fit the animation? Actually, I didn't do. I mean, I did some initial development work on Brother Bear, but you know. I, I, as a director, it's it's really up to me to to kind of let go of that. It's it's not just my vision; it's the studio vision. I want you know I've got an idea of what I want it to be, but you know I also want to let the the artists that we've hired to to work on it to do their job. And so much of that was not me; it was it was the other artists. Um, Mark we, Berger, oh sorry, go ahead. I was going to say we talked about you know as a group we talked about you know, the style of the film and a lot of that, but we, you know, we all came up with it together. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were still going. Uh, Martin Berger says, uh, speaking of backgrounds, are there any updates on the uh, traditional background painting course in the style of Brother Bear? No, there isn't. We no actually back. have not been working on that yet. Yep. I did a Terrell, Witchlatch, a Terrell Whitlatch workshop and course on schoolism, and she mentioned her work on Brother Bear. Is there one of her books you would recommend buying first? Um, Which one did you write the forward to? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> For a second, I thought you said Terrell uh, Witchlatch. Nope. Did not say that, Dustin. Did not say that. You misheard. I was just going to grab those for you. You beat me to it. <laughs> go to, uh, can you go to this camera, Dustin? Or can you go full, yeah, full screen on the face? Yeah. There you go. So these books from Terrell, Whitlatch, I highly recommend. So Animals, Real and Imagined by Terrell Whitlatch. Let's 
see here. Yeah, so that's an awesome one. Then there is The Science of Creature Design by Terrell Whitlatch. Understanding the Anatomy. Oh, look. Forward by Aaron Blaze. Mm. Oh. <laughs> so, yes, I got to write the forward for this book. Um, it's a very, very good book. And uh, Terrell is, you know, you'll recognize Terrell's work from Avatar, Star Wars. Um, she's an incredible character designer. And creature designer and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah, just amazing she's actually, knowledge. She's actually a trained zoologist as well. Exactly. So her... Her biology sense is amazing. And then there's the principles of creature design. So all three of these books I highly recommend. They're amazing. She's amazing. She's an incredibly kind person, uh, an incredible artist, and uh, I'm a fan. Uh, Thomas, this is an interesting question, asks, if you can remember, what was the most cheated cheated shot or sequence you animated? And by cheated, I mean hiding certain things with perspective and the camera and the shot, et cetera. That's a really hard question to answer because we cheat a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of one that's the most the one that cheated. I remember. The, the one that I remember that comes to mind off the top of my head and I can't remember if you did the animation on this or if it was Tom, but it's the one in The Lion King where the bath is happening and the, where, they're, where they're licking. And some, because somebody did a gag about how, like, what the, the mother's neck would have had to have looked like to actually be. Huh. Do you remember that? Like, the anatomy I, isn't. That one was probably on, on uh, Tom's because on Nala, I, that one, I, I know I did the anatomy right on that one no no I, the, the cubs are right it has to do with like I'm, no i'm talking about the mother because yeah, yeah, i did sarabi too yeah, not yeah. sarabi but uh oh, what was nala's mother's name because i animated her as well she's only in a couple shots but no i've heard that is it possible to work in the animation industry just by doing traditional drawings yeah but you're uh, working on paper and, and you know working traditionally with traditional mediums probably not I would say I would I would say no I mean there's a lot of artists that do work primarily in traditional media but if you want if you want to increase your chances of being hired you, you need to be able to cross mediums for sure yeah I mean I, I, I can't think of a studio that you could go to now where you only do traditional media I can't think of a single studio Now, if you're just talking about drawing and painting, yeah, sure. That's, that's what you would do as a designer. And it depends on what kind of things you want to design, whether it's environmental design, character design, prop design. Yeah, this is so weird. I keep on YouTube, I, the, the chat doesn't refresh. I keep having to... Um... Refresh it? Yeah, refresh the window to get it to. Oh, no, I fixed it. It was some, for some reason, the toggle was just top chat. It wasn't giving me the live chat. That's strange. I've never seen that before. Uh, membership question. If one buys a membership for the year, can one still watch the Snow Bear pr production streams out of order if one schedule doesn't line up with the live streams? Yes. Yes, 100% can. So we archive all of those streams. And yeah, the you only don't have way, to, if you miss them live, you'll still be able to come back and watch them. Absolutely. Recorded. But only through our website. There's like a special, when you log into your account, there's a link that says Snow Bear live streams and you can. Yeah, we've got like 50 of them now, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you consider yourself more of a character animator or a creature animator? It seems you were cast more for creatures at Disney and are now doing Snow Bear. Uh, no, I was always character. I was never a creature. I think by creature they mean animal. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we all did either human or animal. Yeah, Aaron also animated Pocahontas in the movie Pocahontas. Yeah, I animated Pocahontas. I animated Jasmine. I animated Aladdin. It's just, you know, people definitely work to their strengths. And my strengths, at, you know, at that time were animal. <clears throat> but, you know, we did a lot of, I've done tons of human animation and, and whatnot. Whatnot. What do you think, uh, do you think is AI a danger or a gift for animation? It could possibly replace in-betweeners in the future. For instance, there's an app already called EBSynth e that can generate from keyframes. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of lazy young artists out there that are afraid to do all the drawings. And I think they're getting excited about that. But I don't know. Um, you know, animation is, you know, the process takes a long time. And I, I've never seen any uh, tweening that's ever done well. It, it always comes out looking mushy and mechanical. One of the things I like about hand-drawn animation is its imperfections. You know, when you watch this, if I play this for you, you're going to see all of the imperfections in it. It's, it's, it's the same as seeing the brush strokes in a painting. And I like that. I like seeing that line crawl. I like seeing, but the other thing too, you know, looking at a two dimensional drawing and, and interpreting it three dimensionally, that's something that's really hard to teach to AI. You know, for, you know, for an AI to, to understand how these drawings work three dimensionally, I don't even know where to begin on how it would learn that. Not only that, I mean like, Tween the animation has existed in 2D forever. Like you, yeah. Like and it going just to looks. It looks bad to me. It looks yeah. Mushy and, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could go all the way back to the days of Flash, and you could take stuff and do keyframes, and the computer would automatically interpret the frames. Now, yes, are there going to be advances in it? Is it going to get to be better? I think it's just like anything else. I think it'll be a tool. I think in some cases it'll work out great, and it'll save time. And in some cases they'll be like, well, that doesn't apply here. Yeah, I we're going to have you, to use a, a person. If you had a short shot where something literally just moved from one point to another and there's not a big perspective change on it, sure, it could probably work. Yeah, one of the things people don't often realize is that, and this is true of animation, it's true of filmmaking in general, it's definitely true of special effects. Every th single shot is its own little production. It sure is. So what works for one shot might not work for another shot. That's, right. <laughs> what, That's exactly right. You know? And your approach might be different. You know, it, in, in Star Wars, there was a lot of times when they used CG. Or there was a lot of times when it made more sense to build a model. Or, you know, and it, it just yeah. depends on what the shot calls for and what is going to get you from point A to point B fast. And the other thing, too, just going back to the in-between thing, so many people think that in-betweening is just literally putting drawings in between to smooth the action out. And it's really, that's only part of it. You know, so much of what I'm doing here, I'm making little micro adjustments here and there that I'm just doing kind of intuitively or, I, or I'm really thinking about, you know, favoring something here, uh, pushing it there in order to get the, the in-between to work more in the way that I want it to work. And so they're, they're, you know, it's so often, most of the time, it's not just a straight, you know, halfway in-between or a third or something like that. It's... It's it's interpreting it and, and what it needs to be for the uh, for the image for the for the shot. And Erica uh, mentioned about the in betweening set, uh, saying yes, Aaron, I I agree. People don't want to put in the work. <laughs> and uh, Zonji says, or Zonji's asking, now that the Friday stream is first Fridays, uh, will it usually focus on Snow Bear production? No. S no, sometimes well, it might and sometimes it won't. Yeah, I'm actually, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to be, um, because I want the Snow Bear production streams to be special. So those are, those are the ones we're going to have for the members. Um, so the, the, this will probably be one of the last ones that I do publicly, where I'm animating Snow Bear uh, for the general public. Um, it's going to go back to more just general, hey, today I'm going to do marker drawing or giant drawing or gesture drawing or whatever it might be. 
Uh, Mandy Lee asks, uh, when you animated... Hey, Mandy um, Lee. When you animate characters like uh, Nala, and Pocahontas, uh, Jasmine, etc., um, are you doing all the shots, or are there other animators doing the same character in other sequences? Also, how many uh, people per character, if so? There's other animators most of the time. Depends on the size of the role. So, for instance, with Raja the tiger, that was my first role, and it was a very small role. Raja's not in the movie very much, so I animated everything, the whole character. But in films like Beauty and the Beast, where I, was, I animated the beast, I was one of six animators of the beast. Glenn Keane was the supervisor, and as a supervisor, it's your job to make sure that all the animation feels consistent, that, your animate, that the animators that are working under you are animating the character in the way that he would act and the way he would look. And, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's what your job is as, as a supervising animator. And so, yes, there are other animators working on those roles uh, in different sequences. Uh, did you ever get to animate or draw a bit of Simba? And if so, are you going to do a live cartoon about lions? Uh, yes, I did. I did uh, quite a bit of Simba here and there, right? What's that? You did a few shots of Simba, right? Yeah, I did a few shots of adult Simba uh, at the end of the film during the fight um, when I was finished with Nala. I was helping out Ruben Aquino, who was the supervising animator of him, of Simba. And then um, and I, also, I, I, I think I did a little bit of young Simba here and there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do a little uh, lion short at some point. Uh, Wolfie Almond asks, uh, is there any chance of lessons on mechanical characters and or objects in the future? Yes. Yes. There is a chance of that. So you're saying there's a chance. There's fact, a one in a million chance. I'm hoping uh, in the near future... Uh, in the next couple of months, we get our course with Peter Hahn in the books. He's uh, considering doing a course very similar on that topic with us. So it's just a matter of scheduling and, and working out timing, and he's great with that sort of stuff. Um, got some other stuff in the works as well. Um, we also want to do an effects animation absolutely. course. And we've got a few people in mind for that. Can I animate on my iPad? Yes. Yeah, there are several programs out there for that. Um, Procreate, Procreate has some great. animation tools in it. Uh, Calipeg is a really great animation piece of software as well. There's uh, a couple of other ones out there that I've also heard good things about. The names aren't coming to me, but there's quite a few animation pieces of software on iPad out there. In fact, that was our last live event, was animating and procreate. Oh, Kirk Michael is here. Says, hey, everyone. Hope hey. you're all well and good. Long time off the streams. Uh, looking good, Sarah Aaron. Uh, this polar bear has attitude. Yes. I know. Any suggestions on using water brushes in the field for sketching in watercolor? Water brushes? The ones that have the water in the barrel. Oh, um, yeah, obviously just keep them wet. Uh, don't squeeze them too hard. That's my biggest mistake is I tend to, I tend to hold my pencil a little hard sometimes. And, uh, and you can squeeze the paint and water right out of them. But it's one of those things you just got to work it and get a feel for it. Arturo Garcia says, uh, I know you animated uh, Adult Simba saying, you don't deserve to live. Yes, I did. I didn't even know you, I, I didn't even know you did that. I did, but, yeah. Uh, did you animate any other shots of him? I did, to, to be honest with you. That's, uh, how long ago was that? That's 30 years ago. I don't remember. <laughs> I think you said you did some more on the fight. I did a few shots in the fight. I just can't remember. Because it was right at the end of the production, too. Um, I did probably three or maybe four shots of 
Maybe. Matter of fact, that the that photo, that big photo of me sitting at my desk, that's animating adult Simba. Okay. Yeah, yeah, animating exactly. I've noticed that before. <laughs> the, um, you also animated adult Simba and the Cub Simba in the Super Nintendo video game, right? Oh yeah, Sega. Well, Super Nintendo Sega was the same. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I should have known better than to correct the video game. <laughs> As James Bond, do you prefer Roger Moore or Sean Connery? Sean Connery. <laughs> and I grew up with Roger Moore, too. I grew up on Pierce Brosnan, and I would, I would choose Sean Connery. You, well, can't, you can't beat the original. Will yeah. there be a course on crocodilians and uh, cetaceans? C-E-T-A-C-E-A-N. Yes. Cretaceous? Um and, uh, and will you ever do a video course on drawing elephants? Because we have the PDF. I think that's what they're referring to. Yes, actually, we, we, I definitely will be doing one on elephants. Uh, I'd like to do some animation with an elephant because you know, for such a long time I was developing the film The Legend of Tembo. And I'd love to do something in 2D with elephants, except uh, the complexity would kill me. But if we could come up with a simple elephant design, it would be a lot of fun to do that. Well, what about that one elephant that uh, you made some animations with, like the uh, sky, uh, the skydiving? Oh yeah, uh, in the elevator. Cyrano? Huh? Cyrano? Cyrano, yeah. The sneezing, exploding all the birds. <laughs> <laughs> Chunk trouble. That was a fun character. If you were to watch a movie again, would you recognize your drawings between the ones, your, draw, your shots from other animators? Oh, yeah. It's like, like Pocahontas. It's so weird because I worked on Pocahontas for almost a year. I can't remember a single shot I animated on Pocahontas. And you obviously were cast on that character, so you did quite a bit. Oh, yeah. No, I, I did a lot of Pocahontas, the character. I just can't remember what I did. But, I, but you probably haven't sat down and watched it in a long time either. So no, I haven't. To their point, it would probably come back to you, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because um, at the end of each production, you can get a cell uh, from that production. And, <laughs> and the cell that they picked for Pocahontas wasn't one of Glenn's cells shots. It was one of my shots. I was like, I don't know why they did that. Because it wasn't a particularly great shot either. That's the thing. Yeah, it's funny working uh, after now not working so, for so long in the three three D business. Like I, I still remember most of the movies that I worked on, but just like you, I I for, forgotten a lot of the shots that I worked on. Those. Yeah. There, there are very few though that I do remember because they were such iconic shots or such good shots. But then there are others that uh, just blend into the action to the point I'm like, I can't tell if I did that one. Yeah. But this is a big jump right here. Big jump? Yeah, this is where, if Erica's watching, this is, Erica, this is where I was mentioning yesterday where I might have to put it on ones. In studying lions and tigers, which, oh, actually, oh before I ask that question, um, when Aaron just said, to Erica, this is what I was saying yesterday. He's referring to on our oh, production stream. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Very smooth segue. So, for those of you that might have joined late, um, if you become a member to creatureartteacher.com, uh, and if you go over there, we've got a couple of membership options that get you access. Uh, twice a week, we're doing animation production streams of the making of Snow Bear. And that's basically you get to be there. Be a fly on the wall in our studio as Aaron produces the uh, stream Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, it also gets you our annual plan, gets you everything else we offer on the website as well, which is now over 600 hours of lessons and courses, and that's $75 off. So go head on over to CreatureArtTeacher.com and check it out. Now let me go back to my question. In studying large cats, lions, and tigers, which do you think is stronger? Tigers. Yeah, I think they're definitely, they're bigger. Yeah, tigers are definitely stronger than, they're bigger. Especially the, 
the Amur, the Siberian tiger. Uh, Philip asked a bit more of a technical question, um, but is there any reason why you guys are using the H.264 codec uh, for your courses instead of H.265, which would help shrink the file size, especially for 4K videos? Uh, we actually, uh, maybe a course or two ago, we, we actually had started. Yeah, most of, our courses are H most of our courses are H.265. Anything pre-H.265 is probably... Uh, two or three years ago, we switched yeah. over, so. Yeah, I think we started the transition. I asked them to keep the files as big as possible <laughs> in order to fill everyone's drives up. And he Which, specifically told he specifically ordered us to try to make it <laughs> just as much file file space. Yeah. Make them as big as the Birds of Prey course. Exactly. Which by the way, remember, if you become a member on our site, you get both streaming and download access as part of the annual plan. So, you know, you don't have to download everything if you're an annual member. You can come back and stream at any time. We do also have a streaming only plan that's like a monthly plan as an option. If you had a chance to work on uh, Lilo and Stitch, which character would you have liked to have animated? Stitch. Stitch? Oh yeah, for sure. Along with your brother? Yeah. Because your brother uh, animated Stitch, correct? Right? Your uncle? My, my uncle, yes. <laughs> he did. He uh, animated, uh, Alex Cooperschmidt supervised the character. <laughs> Arturo cracked a joke with you uh, when you mentioned they uh, can't remember all the animations you did. He says, what? You don't remember what scenes you animated of a character you weren't in charge of from a movie <laughs> released almost 30 years ago? Aaron, you disappoint me. I know. <laughs> Do you like Beavis and Butthead? No, never did. Even when it was popular, I, I, I didn't like it. Not that I'm against that. I mean, I, there's a lot of bathroom stuff that I love. But uh, I just didn't, I didn't like it. I never was into it. I never really watched much of it myself because I think I was a little young at the time for that, that kind of humor. Um, well, considering, yeah, you were one. <laughs> well, they... they they had quite a lot of reruns on like Adult Swim and stuff. Oh, but, right. um, I love South Park. So, oh yeah. Love. Well, also King of the Hill. Yeah. Keep your hands on my propane tank. <laughs> Wait, the guy with you is your son? <laughs> yes. Dustin is Aaron's son. Yes. Yeah. Yeesh. Hello. And most everybody thinks that Nick is my son as well. <laughs> and it's, and it's, I'm your grandson. We all know that. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> Dustin has seen me at my worst and my <laughs> best. <laughs> Did you get to meet John Candy during Rescuers Down Under since he was the voice of Wilbur? No, I was a, I was a little grunt back then. Nope. Uh, Christina uh, asks, how long does it take you to animate a character? Seven. Seven. <laughs> I, that's, a, that's a very broad question. It takes, are you talking about the entire production? Are you talking about, it just, it doesn't, it, you know, there's complexity levels in each shot. There's a lot of different variables. But this is going to take me about a year to animate all of Snow Bear. But... For 10 How minutes. about this particular? Let's say this particular shot, for example. This shot has taken me two weeks. It's 19 seconds of animation. It's taking you two weeks so far. Yeah, it's taken me two weeks up to this point, and I'm determined to finish it today. All the character animation. I still have to add shadows because this is going to be a shadow shot. It's going to have lighting in it. So I have to add shadows, and I still have to finish the effects. 
And following up with the technical question uh, from earlier, uh, Philip asked, isn't the paper an animation in uh, H.264, though? <laughs> the paper animation course? No, I don't believe so. I think you're just talking paper animation in general. I don't know, making a joke. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. Have you ever drawn an Okapi? It's the only living relative of the giraffe. I have. Matter of fact, I just saw an Okapi last weekend. It's funny you brought that up. Plus, we've seen them in person. Yep. In the wild, I mean. No, we've never seen an Okapi. Wait, we haven't? No, Okapis are from the Congo. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm mixing them up with uh, something else. Oh, yeah. Yes, please. You know where I saw a copy? Animal Kingdom. Can I, get a, can I get a Red Bull? I'll take a vodka soda if we're just doing drink orders. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Waiting for Aaron to come back. Oh, there he is. Thank you. And we're back. Sorry, I had to. I was getting a little parched. Aaron, I'm very Steven interested in the Aaron. musical aspect of animated movies. Do you know if the musicians in the orchestra are freelance, or does Disney have their own symphony orchestra record the scores? They're freelance. They're always freelance. Disney does not have. Matter of fact, I don't think any film company has their own orchestra. So yeah, like, um, but typically for a film, it's 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 either an orchestra that's assembled for that film or it's actually a, a working orchestra will be hired sometimes too. Like it'll be like the, the yeah. whatever Philharmonic, you yeah. know. More often than not though, it's all, they're all union musicians in Hollywood. And they literally, they come in and their whole job is coming in to, to work on scores. And um, there's a lot of them. They'll come in and they, they get their music and they're all pros. I mean, they just, they're such good musicians. They, I remember there's a, a couple of uh, women that uh, were doing, um, they were working, they were doing a harp. They were playing the harp. And they came in with their knitting and got all set up. And they would just sit there and knit between their role, their parts in, in the, on the score. And then they'd put their knitting down and pluck away. It was interesting. Randall asks, hey, Aaron, in 10 years from now, when Snow Bear is finished, will you be going back to every Friday live streams? I will miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it feels like it's going to take forever, doesn't it? Because trust me, I lay in bed every single night and I'm not exaggerating. I lay in bed every night thinking about this, this blasted cartoon. Stupid cartoon. Um... Uh, are there free range chickens in Tampa? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, asking if there's free like roaming range the city? Like in Tampa, like are there chickens that just free roam around? I don't think so. There might be, maybe in some, some I mean, of the residential areas in Rebor or something. I don't know. Not that I've ever heard of. No, I'm not. I've Man, I remember once seeing a chicken cross the road, but that was in uh, the land. That was in, in Tampa. <laughs> I've. There's free roaming chickens in Kauai, on the Everywhere. island of Kauai in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Um, Mark of Art asks, how do I draw the same characters in different angles and expressions, especially made up characters? I've been having a hard time with this in your character design course. It's really getting that. I mean, it's look at this. Look at this shot here. I mean, this you have to get that character down in your mind. And that just comes from drawing that character over and over and over again so you understand how that character is built three-dimensionally in your head. And that's what it takes. Boy, this is a big gap. This is a big jump right here. Why is it that in all the second and third parts of Disney anim animated films, as far as like the later sequels, the animation is almost always because uh, they cut the budget. Not as not as good. Yeah, not as good. Yeah, they they cut the budget. Wow, this is kind of wild. I had never knew this. There is a wild chicken population that resides in Ebor City and has for over a hundred years. Yeah, that's, that Ebor City exactly. Because I, I, I swear, never knew that. 
I because I I was there before, and I Tampa, swore so I saw some chickens there. I'd never seen them, so there you go. Yeah, there are chickens in Tampa. Free roaming chickens. <laughs> Ebor's a sort of a little area inside of Tampa, so. And uh, Zonji says I I loved the Bulgarian women's choir music in uh, Brother Bear. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's always been my favorite sequence is that, uh, is that transformation scene, just the colors, the, yeah, the, the, we really enjoyed making that part of it, the writing yeah. of it, the recording of it, all of it. It's great. What would happen if Kenai and Koda met your snow bear? Uh, they'd have a grand old time. Thumbnails and storyboards have the same function for each medium, right? Say that again? I think they're meaning, by medium, medium, they're meaning live action and animation. But they're saying thumbnails and storyboards have the same function for each medium, right? No, not really. Storyboards are storyboards. Thumbnails are like... Thumbnails... Are like rough? A thumbnail can be a rough for anything. It's a thumbnail is, is, is it's basically planning out, roughing out an idea. A storyboard is actually executing a storyboard. So you can do thumbnails for, story. for storyboards. Right. And in fact, you usually do. Exactly. Right? I do thumbnails for animation. I do thumbnails for illustrations. You know, thumbnails are, it's basically the planning of a, of, of a piece of art. Do you think The Jungle Book was or might be one of Disney Animation Features uh, best films? No, but that's only my opinion. If that's your opinion, I think that's awesome. I think, I think Disney has several. I think uh, Brother Bear being Bambi King is huge. I think uh, Sleeping Beauty technically is one of the best films they've ever done. I think arguably uh, Fantasia for what it was, was one of the best. It was ahead of its time. And of course, you can't forget Black Cauldron. <laughs> of course, oh, yeah, Black, Black Cauldron. Cauldron is the best in the world. <laughs> <laughs> do you picture Glenn the polar bear having a voice? If so, what does he sound like? And who would I you don't. cast to play I actually, I, he has no voice in my mind, not even a bear voice. Hey, not even a, I just see him hey. as this mute kind of character. It's kind of funny. Have you had a chance yet to get to draw in VR? I bet you would love it. I have I have had a chance to draw in VR, and I did love it. We are going to do that on a future live stream or video. I think I still have the software. I think I still have the app installed on my laptop. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I haven't used my VR in, in quite a while. I know we've already... Um, answer this question uh, uh, earlier but this person uh, shut up <laughs> but uh, what's your take on AI and uh, how do you think this will affect the industry um, I don't I, I think people are freaking out about AI in the same way they freak out about copyright and people stealing their ideas nobody's stealing your idea okay yeah AI is learning on other people's ideas I get that and that's that's not cool I do think jobs will be lost. Do I think everybody's going to be that's in the art industry going to be impacted by it? Not really, at least not in the immediate future. I do think down the road. I don't think it's stoppable. I'm not. I don't like it, but I don't think it's going to affect me really that much. I'm, I'm going to continue to make films. Um, photography never replaced painting. Um, I don't know. I just. Uh, the way they train the the software i think is got to, the ethically has got to change so i think that's something but i think a lot of people are making a stink about it that don't really need to make a stink about it probably an unpopular opinion And I personally find it more of a just a party trick at best. Well, it's I mean, 
AI is writing music and, and writing articles and you know doing all kinds of stuff like that, which is, um, it's inevitable that that was going to happen at some point. Um, yeah, it's just how do you how do you bend with the times? You know, AI art to me is not about. Um, it's not about the computer or the software creating art. It's about artists not wanting to do the work. You know, that's coming. It's coming about because there's people out there that they really they want to create the the art, but they don't want to put in the twenty years that it takes to become skilled, or thirty years, or a lifetime, for that matter. That's where that's that's my biggest take on it. You know, everybody wants it's 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 the instant, uh, instant gratification, instant stardom. That's the culture we are right now. And you know, the truth is, when it comes to animation uh, or art, you know, to be adept at it, you've got to you've got to put the time and the work into it. And AI came about because of people that don't want to do that, in my opinion, once again. In my humble opinion. Oh, boy, big, big gaps right here. Well, this is a good comment from Bob. That uh, this is he's quoting what Proko said. Proko said that AI art won't stop him from creating art because art is a form of communication, and just because a robot can speak, it doesn't mean we would all stop speaking. Hey, that's a great that's a great way of putting it. That's a good one. Thank you, Proko. That guy. Um, Wolfie asks, "Hi, Aaron. Is there a project that you consider?" quote unquote, the one that got away as you either turned it down or decided to work on an alternative project? No, well, there's projects that got away where either, you know, life happened or <laughs> bankruptcy happened to the company. I've got two movies that I wish I could have finished. One was King of the Elves that, you know, a lot of things happened to me in my life while I was trying to make that film that I just didn't work out. And then the other one was The Legend of Tembo, which was uh, an, a film about an elephant, and uh, the company went bankrupt. So those, I, yeah, I would love to be able to, to make those. Man, this is, see, here's a good example of tweening this, the in-betweens through here are so complex in figuring this out. Doing automatic in-betweens would be very difficult.
Man. Complexities, complexities, complexities. Let's see how that looks. So far, so good. We're getting some nice smoothness. It's right through here. some in-betweens in there. I wanted it to be a quick walk back. Hey, Aaron, I've noticed this hump on a lot of animals when I'm drawing them between the shoulder blades. Do humans have that bone too or, so, or only some mammals? No. So humans don't have that. So what that hump is, let me show you. Let's switch gears here for a second. Here's my thumbnail for the last video we just put out. Don't save. So, with hoofed animals, let's say uh, a bison. Bison's a really good example of, a, of that hump. If you look at the skull, okay, so, and there's a horns coming up if you follow the vertebrae coming back hopefully you guys can see this you know we've got the shoulder blade that comes down like so hooks into the shoulder of the upper arm and it comes down to the wrist and then feet, okay? Actually, this comes in more on here. Here's the spine coming down. And then we've got the pelvis, femur, like so, okay? And then a rib cage, big rib cage on a bison. Very big rib cage coming into here. Now, because a bison, and the tail comes off like so. Now, because a bison, uh, you know, they eat a lot of grass, right? A lot of, like a lot of herbivores. So they need a lot of guts to, um, to digest all that cellulose, all that plant matter. And so they need a good suspension bridge to hang for all that weight to hang from and so as a result the ridges on the backs of the vertebrae have evolved to be really big like that on the backs of the vertebrae and what you get out of that is this big muscle attachment so you get big muscle attachment to here coming down let me actually change let me change color <laughs> So what you get is a lot of muscle attachment coming down, the trapezius muscle in here, coming down and attaching on this side, comes across the latissimus muscle. And it, all that is there to hold up, you know, it all attaches down into the belly. I kind of got all this a little bit off. And there's our, our little bites in the head right there. So, um, that's what that's for. Now you've got other animals, and, and, and there's varying degrees of how high, you know, horses even have that to a smaller degree. Now you've got other animals that are more om omnivorous, let's say, um, like a bear. And they're more about, you know, like a grizzly bear is more about the muscle that's there. So, Very funny, Zonji. Zonji said, is Dustin still there? I, I heard Aaron say, bye, son. 
Nice. <laughs> so here is our very badly drawn bear skull coming into shoulders down to the arms and the wrist and down here actually I should get that a little longer and what we have here is just a lot you know they're the I can't remember what they're called the ridges on the backs of the vertebrae aren't really huge on a bear more the scapula is more down on the side but you got a lot of muscle attachment and so that hump and, and a lot of muscle in the neck Here's our little bear. So you've got a lot of muscle attachment and a lot of muscle here, which is what causes that hump in the bear. Now bears are kind of medium as far as their guts go, right? Because they, they eat, actually they eat about 80% plant material and about 20% uh, meat. Actually it might even be less than that. Okay, so there's your, there's your little anatomy lesson. Hope that helped. I have to add a few drawings in here in that turn. I think I'm going to. I think you should. I think I need to. Just added drawings to my work. Just get that. I'm not going to put it on ones like we were talking about before, but I did add some timing to add more drawings. Because ones, um, I think it's going too fast. Ones wouldn't change the timing, it would just change the number of drawings that you see. I think we actually need to change the timing. So once again, if, um, if you guys are new coming on, uh, this is going to be our last live stream before we start going to once a month. And uh, we're going to be doing that the first Friday of every month. And uh, we're going to be focusing more on production of Snow Bear. And you can still catch me twice a week uh, doing production for Snow Bear. Um, if you become a member... Um, you can also become a member on our Patreon and, and catch us there. Or you can uh, buy a new membership uh, option that we've created where uh, you can pay just for the live streams and catch us twice a week. All true. I wouldn't lie to you. And we're still going to be putting out weekly videos on Yes. We're not going away. We're just going to focus on, uh, we want to finish up Snow Bear this year. So We've been at Snow Bear for s going on seven years now. It's not full production. No. We've it's just, it's. We've been working on it for a year. For about the last year. But. Yeah. And um, it's just something that we came up with the idea about seven years ago. And, uh, and it's just been kind of percolating. For a long time, we finally decided, okay, if we're ever going to get this done, we need to just do it. So we're very much in trying to get this done mode.
Oh, how did uh, T-ball go? It went great. We had our first T-ball practice. I've got a lot of four-year-olds on the team, so that's, <laughs> I'm a T-ball manager. I've got a six-year-old son and a six-year-old granddaughter. So you guys figure that out. <laughs> right. And um, I've got, uh, this is uh, the second year for my son playing T-ball and the first year for my granddaughter. And so it's her age ranges are four to seven. So you were able to get her on? Yeah, I was, yeah. I forgot to tell you that. Yeah. Pulled some strings. <laughs> did you have, did you have to line a few pockets? Yeah. yeah. Grease a few palms. Yeah. No, I just asked again. <laughs> asked someone else. <laughs> I was like, there you go. It's a 10 minute short. You would think it's a movie, but it's a 10 minute short. We're, we're doing it all ourselves, which is why it's basically, I'm doing as much work as I would have done on a feature. Actually, I'm doing a little bit more than what I would have done as an animator on a feature. Uh, it's apples and oranges. Frazetta was an incredible draftsman. He could draw incredibly, along with painting and everything else. But his subject matter obviously was completely different. I've heard that old cartoons like Scooby-Doo cut a lot of corners to save time. In what ways would they do that? Like in betweening less, et cetera? In betweening less, doing a lot more held cells, doing partial held cells with... With like like the the head would be held, but the facial features will be on another level where they're where they're talking. There's a lot of cycles, different cycles. Cycles, yeah. yeah. Backgrounds. You know, if you remember growing up, watching those backgrounds go by and they constantly repeat. <laughs> remember that watching that as a kid. Especially in the fun stuff. That's why I remember seeing that. Yeah. Yeah, like all those shows, like Flint, like said Flintstones, and even uh, I think the Jetsons. I actually liked it when it did that. It, yeah. it didn't. It didn't take me out of it at all. Did you know that Tim Burton couldn't draw the fox and the hound? I wonder why Disney hired him to work with Glenn Keane on that film. Well, Glenn. He said Tim Burton said that about himself. He said, "Oh, I, I was a terrible animator." Yeah. Yada yada yada. But I don't think that's true. I think obviously he had to be good, or else he wouldn't have been. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he wasn't Glenn Keane. Yeah, no. In, in that sense, well, it's not even that. It's just because Tim Burton's great. It's just Glenn Keane is a certain. It's the same thing I was talking about. You know, the difference between Glenn and Eric Goldberg. It's just different sensibilities. Oh, I think my mic died. Oh. Ah. Looks like it. Yeah, I'll 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 take care of it. But I don't. I mean, it's gonna die. Yeah. We've been having mic issues. Mike Wachowski. Uh, for, yeah, so we were just talking about Tim Burton. Yeah, I mean, obviously he was a talented animator or else he wouldn't have been hired to begin with. But right. I get what, you know. Aaron, I was wondering, how do animated movies or short films make trailers before the movie is finished? Does the trailer content get created first? It's, they're grabbing, because they're grabbing, uh, we used to have to get ready for trailers. So we would go through and identify which shots are going to go into the trailer, and then you focus on getting those shots done. It's as simple as that. It's a pretty simple thing, but you, you, just, you have to plan the trailer ahead of time. And then you just focus on getting those shots out. 
Uh, let me know in the comments if my mic cuts out again, because it, it might. Um, are the other people there in the room with you animators, or do they do something else? Um, my background is in animation. I went to school for it, um, but I kind of wear all kinds of hats. I, I used to do art, graphic design, animation, interactive websites. Now, primarily, I never worked on any animated features or anything like that. Um, but I understand the language. And Dustin, you can talk a little bit about your background. You used to do yeah. 3D stereo and all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, the yeah closest thing to animation that I have is um, uh, is as a uh, 3D uh, deaf animator, and not like in uh, CGI or any of that stuff. It's more of um, uh, taking a flat 2D image and uh, turning it into a 3D uh, image. So if you see a movie in in 3D in the movie theater, things like that, where you have a 3D TV. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I would do because it's actually cheaper um, in the long haul to uh, convert it through a computer than using an actual 3D camera because I, I they're actually, so expensive. I have a question for but you the, But it doesn't you, look as good. Yeah, well, that was my question. So movies like Avatar are shot in 3D. I mean, they're shot yeah. with two, two cameras side by side. Yeah. Do you still, on a film that's shot with 3D, will they adjust that depth and post sometimes? The, or the, is it, or they, is it what you shoot, what you shoot, and it, that's it? They can at times, but usually they try to calibrate the... Um, it takes a lot of calibrating with the cameras themselves to get that depth that they, that they want. Mm -hmm. um, and... And the post production with the CG, uh, because the CG is already rendered out, they just try to match. They try to match up uh, the two camera angles with with the CG as well. Yeah. Um, and we call those uh, in the in the special effects department. We call those uh, uh, elements. Right. Um, so like all the CG characters, all the backgrounds, all that, all the, all those are elements. And uh, the business I was in. Uh, oh, my mic's dead. I wonder if it's a temperature thing. No, I think it's the battery. Yeah, I think the battery is just is shutting off, pooping out. Oh, we need a new receiver. Well, but sorry, um, guys. I think that um, I'll just stand right here. Is this, <laughs> is this awkward at all? <laughs> Not at all. That's a nice line. <laughs> but the um, but I think if I recall, um, the company that I worked for uh, after Digital Domain Media Group, which is where I got started in uh, 3D animation, um, the other company that I got part of, uh, Stereo D, uh, they actually took part in quite a bit of uh, the first avatar uh, for, for death animation. And, um, but, um, but yeah, um, the thing about, yeah. <laughs> But wait, I'm trying to think here. You know how my works. But 3D cameras, they a lot of times they have a tendency to mi miss certain details, uh, like the some bookshelves can be flattened out or anything of that sort of stuff. They can't catch all the detail, um, and so that's why. And so also, they'll go, so they'll go in and enhance it. Yeah, and so the. Um, but another reason why uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, to do it with a crew to just convert it through a computer is because of the whole calibrating issue with uh, with three D cameras because it takes a lot of time and the cameras themselves are very expensive and the longer you're renting them out the more expensive it gets uh, unless you're James Cameron you just build them or yeah that. <laughs> um, but meanwhile if you go to um, to a three D company especially one like Stereo D which they have a really great reputation. Um, you can tell them I, I want the 3D to look uh, I want it to be uh, deep, I want it to have a lot of detail um, I want the focus to be on these sorts of characters and they can work on all the different uh, factors in there That's cool. And, um, or you can make them very shallow there's other companies though that don't quite uh, like real 3D well. huh? like real 3D Nah, it, I mean the it, company Real 3D. World War, I don't know about Real World 3D, but I've seen some. I've seen really good 3D, like the ones we did at Stereo D, but then I've seen really bad 3D. Yeah. Like Clash of Titans was the worst. That was really bad. Because that was straight up just 
all they really did was just took the screen and just pulled orbs out of the out of that 2D uh, yeah. screen. Like there's it no looked like cutting. faces projected on eggs. Yep. And then um, and then in Saw 3D, all the characters and everything there there was depth. But there was no shape or angle. It was just all looked like they were just all flat cards. Yeah. But that was the real fun take, uh, fun thing to learn in uh, in Stereo D and or just in 3D itself was because not only did we create the 3D depth, but we also did all shaping. We uh, used different techniques to create the angle. So if we did it right, we were able to get it down to the point you couldn't tell the difference between a 3D camera or uh, computer process 3D. Yeah. Aaron, I was wondering what brush you're using now. This is the number two pencil that TV Paint provides, standard. Well, you got a shot over there. There. Yeah, so the brush I'm using, I should actually just repeat the question. The brush I'm using is the number two pencil. You find it over here on the side, right here, paper pencils. And it's the second one in, number two pencil. I've got the opacity turned all the way up. And I've got the size cranked up. Because I'm actually, uh, we're animating this uh, all in 4K. So I've got to punch up the size of my brushes when I get them. Because they, they tend to be a little small when I'm animating in 4K. All right, let's see how that turn feels now. Since you've mentioned that you've traveled to many countries, have you ever happened to catch the dubbed versions of the films you've worked on? Yes. I love it. It's really cool. It's weird. I saw Japanese. I've seen German. It's interesting. I was um, Steve and Claudia, who work with us uh, at Creature Art Teacher, are... Uh, they're married, and uh, Claudia is from Mexico originally, and they were telling me the other day that they've been watching uh, reruns of The Simpsons, and um, she's been making Steve watch them in Spanish because it drives her crazy that the characters have completely different voices than what she's grown up with. Like, <laughs> she's grown up with them with the Spanish exactly. voices. Exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Apparently, some characters are close, like tonally, but like some are like wildly different. I think if I understand correctly, right she was saying Marge sounds like a completely different human being. That's know. really funny. And I would imagine if you've grown up hearing the one character, especially something like The Simpsons, that's oh, yeah. like, you know, it, would, it wouldn't be right. Yeah. You know, yeah, kind of like, like, a, kind of like the uh, anime series of Pokemon. There was a particular voice actor that um, in the main role for, for uh, Ash Ketchum was the main character for so long that they eventually changed the voice at, uh, actor, and when they did, it was like, oh. <laughs> like, he obviously tells a different person, like, I don't know how I feel about this. All right, we're getting close. Uh, where is Snow Bear going to be uh, shown? In theater or online, like well, YouTube? We definitely will do a limited run in theaters just so we can have it eligible. In order for it to be eligible for any kind of awards, uh, it needs to have a run in theaters. And we'd like it to be eligible. It'd be nice to have a little, some film awards under our belts. Um, if we're so lucky. If we're so lucky, exactly. Um, or at least be in the running. So uh, it'll probably be a limited run in, in maybe Los Angeles, Orlando. Uh, not sure. We have, we're, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And my burger asks uh, is asking me what is the process of 3D post production? Um, it's multiple steps. Uh, when you get the when we get the uh, uh, the shots, we get the scenes. Uh, first, we get uh, the rotoscopers to go in and rotos rotoscope everything in the shot. And and by everything, I mean if it's a large, if it's a wide open scene of like a like a landscape shot, for example, you want to they'll want to rotoscope all the trees 
if there's a lake, rotoscope the lake. Uh, if there's people in the distance, rotoscope all the individual people. Um, if it's a person up close and they have to rotoscope like the eyes, the eyelashes, the hair, like everything you can see around you would be rotoscoped in the shot. And then after it's ro after it's all rotoscoped, then it comes to guys like me, the de the death artist, and we would use the rotos the rotoscope uh, and the shot itself to create the three D, and and my animation would be part of the uh, of getting the shape and the angle because you have to animate all all the angles and shapes in the shot, um, and once that gets approved, then it goes to the client. Um, and if the client likes the likes the shot, then it gets uh, ready to be uh, um, painted, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. But if not, then it goes back uh, to a different person that handles all the client notes. Um, and then after that, the painter's going if uh, if it's just a practical effect, in which the painter is the other half of the, uh, of the death artist because painters. Well, uh, let me think for a minute here. The death artist, <clears throat> the way they make the, the 3D is they actually shift the image over and create what's called a, a, a false eye, uh, making a second eye, which makes the 3D. Creating so, another angle, right? Huh? Just basically creating another angle. Exactly. And... Um, but when you're doing that, you're creating gaps in the image. You're creating um, gaps of data. And so you end up seeing all these little um, gaps of pixels where like, a, where a person would be sitting or where a building would be. And so the painters go in and they create multiple layers of the shot and create what are called clean plates. Um, and the clean plates, they f uh, help fill in the background. So um, while I create the cracks in the image, um, the painters like my old roommate Seth would go in and fill in those cracks and create and make an fill the cracking go cracking um, <laughs> and then uh, then afterwards uh, if there's any uh, um, any visual effects any CG such as like a blue screen background or any CG characters um, those in between the, those uh, sections between the death and the painters um all the CG elements would be would be put in, and usually uh, the CG elements are already uh, already have the three D depth rendered out, um, and so those wouldn't really need to be messed with much. Um, all they really need be is just be put in, just re rendered. That's kind of about it. Oh, I completely cheated this. But that is the basic, very rough gist of uh, what. The process was like in the in the three D death industry. Better animator Richard Williams or Milt Hall? Who's the better one? You know, once again, it's apples and oranges. Uh, you know, I. Um, but that's just a taste thing. Sorry, I've got I've got some crazy stuff happening here. Completely messed up the t the turnaround on the feet. <laughs> so um, I I liked um, I always felt like Milk Hall's performances felt a little bit more uh, naturalistic. Get rid of these feet. I gotta re redo these. Oops. Let me do this. There we go. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -da 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 oh, and to, and to um, and to finish the answer that um, because I only mentioned about what I did before. What I do now here is um, I. I help film uh, most of the uh, YouTube videos and courses, mainly with uh, with Dad. Um, 
and I do I help with the editing for those videos and I also help uh, maintain the, the stream and on the sidelines I do uh, wildlife photography in which I have quite a few uh, reference packs on creatureartteacher.com oh dang it <laughs> I guess I'll have to sell them elsewhere so the idea here is that the foot goes backwards that's what it was uh, Castro asks, what's your favorite James Baxter scene? Uh, probably the ballroom dance with Beauty and the Beast. Mm. Were there any animators in the field that you worked with that you were blown away by that everyone thought was on another level, like Bill Call, for instance? Glenn Keane. Glenn was always on that. And probably James Baxter, right? Yeah. For sure. Uh, just a question of preference. From an idea to final product point of view, do you prefer when uh, ideas are developed as a group or is it better to say, hey, I have this idea for a project. What do you think? I'm not really sure how I have to bring that question right. Yeah, say it one From more time. idea to final product, when you start a new project, will this be like a school project with teamwork and groups? Or is there someone overhead saying, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? It's just a question of your preference. Like, how do you prefer ideas? Oh, I'm, well, like what we're doing here, this is our idea. Right. And I definitely prefer that. You know, it's not like a, uh, this is my way or highway. But I think, like, you know, as far as Disney films and stuff go, it happens all kinds of ways, right? I mean, oh, some, yeah. some ideas just come from one person that has a, a brilliant brainstorm, and yep. some are a team, and, you know, there's a whole art of pitching. And exactly. But ultimately, it is a team effort, no matter yeah, where course. the idea comes from, Absolutely. yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna we're coming up on our two and a half hour mark. I'm gonna finish this drawing, and then uh, we'll call it a quits for today. Oh yeah, and uh, Julia is gonna is actually gonna hit the hay now because it's 10 p.m. there in Athens. It's 10:15. <laughs> Good night, Julia. Five o'clock somewhere. So we're almost there. Like I said, we're two weeks into this shot. 19 seconds of animation. It's, you know, this is a great lesson in just patience in your work and, and keeping your eye on the on the goal. You know, animation is such a marathon; it's not a sprint. I'm always saying that, and you know, the amount of work that we're putting into 19 seconds, and ultimately, it's going to be 10 minutes of, of work that we do on this thing. Um, you know, you just gotta you just gotta make your little mini goals and in this case our mini goals are to you know get a certain amount done each week and, and a big part of it is keeping it scheduled you know adjusting the schedule as we go uh, Chelsea says hey Aaron uh, your animal anatomy knowledge is great uh, I'm in vet school right now and uh, taking small and large animal anatomy classes and I think you'd be a great professor to teach general anatomy especially for exotic animals uh, did you ever want to become a veterinarian at one point I actually worked at a vet's office when I was 12 years old because I did want to become a vet and um, but part of the job was putting so many animals to sleep it just broke my heart and 
and there is a dog track actually nearby. This is in Bonita Springs, Florida. And they put to sleep so many greyhounds because they just couldn't run anymore. And I just didn't want to have anything to do with that. So, yes, I considered being a veterinarian at one time when I was a kid. But then I, you know, obviously art was a, a much bigger draw for me. Not even the, the dog track thing aside, but I've talked to a lot of people that are in vets, have gone to vet school and stuff and have been surprised by how much of it is just... Yeah. You know, so you're not saving animals yeah. as often as you think you are versus... Yeah, I remember one, one day in particular, this poor lady... She was probably 90-something years old, and she had had this cat for 25 years. 25 Yeah, years? it was a three-legged, one-eyed, I mean, the whole cliche. Oh, wow. And But it was time to put it down. And that poor lady, oh, my gosh, she was so heartbroken. It was so hard to... I just, that's not, that's not what I want to do. And how old was uh, Maxfield? Oh, I don't when remember. We, when we had to put her down. Because she was in her, like, I think she was right around there. It wasn't quite that old, but yeah, I don't remember. She was like, I think she was like more like, maybe. All right, there it is. There's our drawing. South Dakota. <laughs> you just did a big S sound. I was like, what is it going to be? Sun. <laughs> I'm trying to speak slither. Sound it out. <laughs> All right, there it is. There's our animation so far. So you can see, you know, <laughs> like, again, the, the marathon part of it's, you know, how do you need an elephant? One bite at a time. Oh, something got out of, out of whack there. Did you see that? Uh-oh. What, what just happened? What? <laughs> that's a nice shot. <laughs> yeah, that's his... That's that's as I can't take it anymore. Face. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I oh I see what happened. I forgot the head. Doesn't offer any art or animation classes. What online resources would be good for me? Well, I would say creatureartteacher.com. That is our. That's our that's our specialty. Lesson. We've got over six hundred hours of art lessons, um, which all can be purchased a la carte. Or you can become a member and get everything for one low price, um, one annual price, and uh, you can cancel or subscribe. And the cool thing is, everything is yours to keep. Um, if you head over to futureartteacher.com. Other than that, there's also a lot of other sites. Uh, you know, some people that we work with, other schools, Schoolism with uh, from Bobby Chu is a good one. Uh, if you're looking for something more uh, formal, there's um, uh, Animation Mentor. Don Bluth has an academy now. John Pomeroy has one. But, um, you know, I can't recommend enough. CreatureArtTeacher.com. Yep. <laughs> CreatureArtTeacher.net is dot com. <laughs> there we go. So that should have fixed it. Oops. Let's see if that fixed it. So, anyway... Um, as far as animation goes, when you want to do full, you know, like this Disney, Disney style animation, it just takes it takes patience, it takes time. You got to be really careful, you know, in your approach. Um, but it can be done, and uh, we're doing it. And I want to show that it can be done. That's our big goal here. And uh, but anyway, once again, thanks for being with us today. Remember, we're not going to be back again until March 3rd. That's our next uh, public live stream. But if you want to see us continuing to live stream and uh, um, you want to watch more of us creating Snow Bear and learn how to make an animated short in real time, um, then go on over to CreatureArtTeacher.com. You can either become a member and get access to the entire site. You can, uh, you can become a member on Patreon and, and, uh, and have access there. You can do our monthly subscription as well, uh, or you can also just subscribe to the uh, live streams themselves. So there's a lot of different uh, approaches and, uh, and you'll be able to join us. And it's a lot of fun. You know, every, like I said, twice a week we get together and um, we've got a, a great bunch of people that always show up 
and we have a good time. We play music because they're private streams, so you can, you know you get to hear my playlist, <laughs> and uh, and you get to see Snow Bear grow and become a film. Artteacher.com and just see what we have to offer. Explore it. See what we got. Otherwise, um, stay safe and go on out and put some beauty back into the world. And I'll talk to you next time.